So the, last January, we had a presentation by Reverend Tarada Gojan, who is the Dushaku of Putigoji Temple on Putigo Mountain, uh, which is located in Uita in Kyushu, Japan. And that was followed by a discussing, discussion about Shugendo, who are mountain monks by Maxine. And these two presentations led me to think about doing a separate weekly gathering, just one <laughs> weekly gathering on sacred mountains conceptually. And among the accommodations, this is an interdisciplinary genre, believe it or not. There is a whole field in, uh, among human geographers and anthropologists who look at sacred mountains. Um, one of his, my former colleague at uh, Bard College of Simon Rock, Chris Coggins, whose primary study are the sacred mountains of China, and he's a human geographer as well as an Asian studies professor. This evening, we're going to start with a broad view and narrow it to some specifics, specifically specifics in Japan, followed by North America, and then locally, upstate New York. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so the first question is, what is sacred? It's universally described in two parts. The first is the origins. It's something that's considered worthy of spiritual respect or devotion, or inspires awe or reverence. Sometimes they'll say fear. Uh, now I refer to this as origins because there is something innate within the place or object most often associated with origins as being either with a, a, a type of being or a deity uh, and something which is venerated. The second type uh, yeah, that's right. is what I refer to as ascribed, and this is what Emil Durkheim wrote about. A place of object wrote about this. It's a place uh, or uh, a place of or object that is dedicated or set apart for the service of worship of a deity or worthy <laughs> religious purpose. And I refer to this as ascribed because these locations are assigned as sacred by usage, usage attribution or designation. A deity may or not may not be associated with this place, though there's always a spiritual relationship. So sacred can be either something which is innate or it can be something which is designated. So and and, and in Buddhism specifically, we have we have both things going on that we'll be that we'll be talking about. So what are the origins of the sacred? Mountains have played a major part in people's lives from the early ages, providing water, food, shelter, and throughout history, they've also formed an integral part of many of the world's religions. Especially prominent mountains are favorite places for religious observance, particularly when they are isolated as mountains, as island mountains, mountains with snow caps, or uninhabited high mountain ranges. The psychological roots of reverence of high places ties to the view that mountains are close to the sky, therefore they're close to heavens, to the heavens. That's plural with heavens, by the way. Um, the clouds surround the mountaintops provide sustenance of rain, and the mountains with volcanoes are places with entry to the interior of the earth, and so therefore it's accessible. As a result, mountains serve as the abodes of the divine beings, deities, and spirits. They have also been perceived as the centers of the dead who live underground as burial places. Often mountains are located where shaman, which are located, uh, and you'll find shaman and healers there, as well as places for oracles. So shamans and, and healers, as well as oracles, are, are often associated with mountains. In other words, mountains, from the concept of the sacred origins, are often linked with the mystical in one way or another. Ascribed sacrality, um, in cosmological myths, mountains are the first land to emerge from primeval waters. Um, they frequently become the cosmic mountains, the world conceived as a mountain. That is, symbolically, they represent the place on which a king or religious leader stands at an investiture. And by the way, I found I find this particular picture fascinating. I cannot imagine somebody who had the idea, let's put a couple of temples up there, right? And the builders do it. And then, yeah, and, and schlep everything up that vertical side. I mean, the Derek. 
It's just it's just amazing to me. Pilgrimages to mountain altars or shrines are favorite practices for types of mountain practitioners. Since recorded histories, mountains have been regarded as sacred with all the many meanings of what is sacred. And there are many specific mountains that are venerated for their spiritual qualities. Now, why don't we take a, a look at several of these? Any examination of sacred mountains will yield many dozens, hundreds of sacred sites located on, in, and around mountains. In virtually all cases, the mountains themselves are perceived to be sacred. Let's begin with a few that we all know. And this is a highly subjective recounting. I should note that in almost all cases, these mountains offer not only a spiritual and religious narrative, but also are places known for their biodiversity and protected status. And I think that there's something that's important about that that we're going to be going into. <clears throat> and we see the first that's located there, is that right? Yes, is Mount Sinai. Uh, this is not the hospital in New York City. This is located in the Sinai Peninsula in Egypt. Mount Sinai, which is about 2,285 meters high, would be an unremarkable mountain if it wasn't for its religious significance. Many believe that this is the mountain where God spoke to Moses and gave him the Ten Commandments. The burning bush of the Torah is reported to be located on this mountain. It's important to note that the actual location of the mountain is unknown. This is a conceptualization. The current small mountain that is venerated is Jeba Musa. Mount Sinai seems to have first developed in the 3rd century AD, that is to say, this particular location. When hermits living in caves on the mountain began to identify their mountain with the ancient holy peak. And for over a thousand years, this belief has drawn pilgrims to the summit. Whether it is the actual place or not doesn't seem to deter the pilgrims. In other words, the the place that's pictured there that is considered Mount Sinai is really a matter of conjecture. It's it's much like, remember a number of years ago, people claimed to have found the the uh, the Ark of, of Genesis story in, I think it was Turkey. You know, they, 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 they claimed to have found some wood from the Ark. Well, you know, that's speculative also, but Mount Sinai is sort of in the same category as that. <clears throat> The next one that I'll talk about is Mount Olympus. In ancient Greek literature, Olympus was the name of the home of the 12 Olympian gods and the throne of Zeus. It's the highest mountain of Greece at 9,500, over 9,500 feet. And there's evidence of a shrine or a sanctuary where sacrifices would be made to Zeus. This evidence includes burnt bones and artifact like images of thunderbolts. Anytime you got burnt bones, you got something going on. In addition to being a sacred area, the area around Mount Olympus has also seen many battles because of its strategic location between Macedonia and Thalassia. Not insignificant, there are over 1,700 different species of flora that grow on the mountain, even though it looks like it's pretty barren, yeah. isn't it? Mount Kal Kalesh, which is the next one in the line there, Thousands of Buddhist Hindus and Jains and Bumpo pilgrims journey to the remote Himalaya town of Darchen each year to make koras, which are ritual circuits, around the base of Mount Kailash. Setting foot on the mountain is considered to be a sacrilege, but one 32-mile kora around the base is believed to erase a lifetime of defilements. If I were any of us, I think we should get quick flights to Kailash. <laughs> Kalesh Mountain is, uh, so, um, let me go back for a second. Scientists have discovered that the top of Mount Kalesh, and here's something that I find remarkable, is actually a man-made vacuum pyramid. It's surrounded by more than a thousand other small pyramids. And according to preliminary estimates, the direct height of the pyramid complex is between 100 and 1800, 1800 meters. 1,800 meters be practically, what, 4,000 feet, or over 4,000 feet. About 6,000. Right, 6,000 feet, yeah, as I said. Um, by comparison, the Egyptian pyramid is only 146 meters. If this, true, if this is true, it would be larger than any pyramid known today. And what is meant by a vacuum pyramid, I don't know if you can see that well, but you'll notice that it's really very symmetrical. And so what 
has been what archaeologists have have deduced from its shape and some other artifactual evidence is that what they did was they didn't build the pyramid as they did in Egypt, where they take blocks mm. and place them one on top of the other. But in this case, they took a mountain mm. and then took away the material on the mountain so that it formed a pyramid. If that makes, if you can see what I'm, mm -hmm. what I'm talking about in that case. You, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, but how did they do that? <laughs> well, so they they school, with a vacuum cleaner. Oh, okay. yeah, they, when did this happen? Well, <laughs> like, because it's a sacred eight? mountain. Oh, oh. It's a sacred mountain. <laughs> okay. And so, Kalesh Mountain is considered the axis of the universe, the pillar of the world. It's a place where the earth connects with the heavens. And it is a prototype of Mount Meru, the world center recorded in Hinduism and Buddhism. Uh, Mount Kalesh and its surrounded regions are designated as a UNESCO World Heritage Site, not only for their cultural and religious importance, but also for their unique ecological diversity. The area is home to a rich array of flora and fauna, including rare species such as the snow leopard and the Tibetan antelope. And, and just another very brief note about this idea of a vacuum pyramid, there are it reminds me of, does anybody remember the name uh, Heyerdahl? Or, or Heyerdahl. Thor Heyerdahl. Well, some archaeologists who remind me a lot of Thor Heyerdahl seem to have created this schemata in which Mount Kalesh that we're just describing here is the center of a vortex of other pyramids, including the ones in Egypt and the ones in, among the Maya mm. um, and others around the world. And that's the center of this connection of pyramids. And so in, in a really interesting fashion, now, don't get me wrong, I'm not going to give credence to this theory, but in, in a interesting fashion, here's a mountain which wa was identified as sacred, they then designated it as sacred by taking away the material to create the appearance of a pyramid, or actually create a pyramid. And then they then further, people looking at this now are putting putting forth the theories, not demonstrated theories, but for theories that it's the, it's the vortex, it's the center of the universe, and these other pyramids all connect to it. I'm just letting you know that it's <laughs> out um, If I had a Facebook account, I'd probably be <laughs> spreading <laughs> all kinds of all kinds of conspiracy theories about it. But I won't do that because I don't have a Facebook. Account. <laughs> the last one I'm going to talk about is Uluru. It's a sacred site of the Anangu tribes of Central Australia, the indigenous people of Western Desert, commonly called Ayers Rock. Luru is a large rock formation in central Australia, technically not a mountain. Uluru consists of hard, rocky remains of a larger mountain that is eroded away. Uluru and the people who inhabit the area hold a plethora of ancient traditions, knowledge, wisdom, stories, songs, ceremonies, and history, which have been passed on from generation to generation, just as it has been for thousands of years before all the way from the original hunter-gatherers of ancient Uru to the present-day Anangu. And these ancient traditions and religions are vastly important to the Anangu way of life and society. So these are just examples of, of four sacred mountains. I, I could have selected any of a hundred or more uh, to, to demonstrate what do we mean by sacred mountains. But let's look at Japan. <clears throat> basically because I know more about it than any place else. Japan is one of the world's most mountainous countries, so it's not surprising that mountain worship is an historic element of Japanese culture. And it should be mentioned that Japan has public holidays, two public holidays, that commemorate the natural world. One is Marine Day, also known as Ocean Day, celebrated on the third Monday in July, and the other is Mountain Day, occurring every year on August 11th. This was created as a day to familiarize people with mountains and appreciate the blessings. And I, I have to say something about 
there's something about Japan which to me is incredible insofar as the currency, the money that they use doesn't have dead presidents on it. It has poets and uh, trying to think of poets and, and other um, artists and people like that. And when you think about most societies from the from the earliest coinage, for instance, we had um, a, a Caesar on a coin, or we might have had a god on a coin, or now like we see, we have presidents and, and emperors, etc. But in Japan, they don't have that. And they've got holidays, which are not just celebratory national holidays or religious holidays. They certainly have those too. But they have holidays which are devoted to the, to nature. One is Marine Day. It's a public holiday. It's, it's a day in which, you know, postal workers don't go to work and government workers don't go to work and kids don't go to school. It's, it's they they try to make it line up on a Monday so it becomes a three day holiday. Um, you know that sort of thing. But think about that. If we could do the same thing in North America and just say, let's have a holiday that celebrates the forests instead of let's have a holiday that celebrates a military victory. I think we would be a different society. <clears throat> so according to Shinto, so going on, according to Shinto belief, natural features such as trees, lakes, streams, rocks, and mountains are the dwelling places of spirits called kami, which hold influence over human affairs and respond to human prayer and ritual. Kami are believed to be concentrated in mountain areas and shrines have been erected to mark sacred spots. The introduction of Buddhism from China in the sixth century further developed the practice of mountain worship as Buddhists who viewed mountains, mountain climbing as a metaphor for the spiritual ascent to enlightenment adopted Shinto sacred mountains as pilgrimage destinations. And in the ninth century, a religious sect called the Shigendo, which Maxine spoke about uh, several months ago, uh, Shigendo, a branch of Tendai and Shingon Buddhism, arose and based its doctrine and practice on mountain climbing itself, believing that practitioners could commune with deities on mountain summits and thereby obtain supernatural practices. So the first mountain we're going to talk about <clears throat> excuse me, is Mount Fuji. And Mount Fuji stands out as a unique cultural symbol at 12,388 feet. Fuji is Japan's tallest mountain. It's easily recognized and greatly re admired for its perfect volcanic cone shape, which many liken to an inverted fan. Japan's two major religions, Shinto and Buddhism, regard Fuji as sacred and the Japanese from all walks of life attest to the power of this natural symbol so deeply inscribed in the na national psyche. And I have to say that there's something really um, amazing about being in the middle of Tokyo and from many different places in Tokyo, you can see Fuji. You can look down the street and there it is at the end of the street. And very recently, there was a uh, real estate developer who had built this large skyscraper that was, I think, uh, 25 or more stories high. And after it was built, it was pointed out to him that it blocked the view of Fuji. This is in downtown Tokyo. It blocked the view of, of Mount Fuji, so they, he took it down. <laughs> As you said, you know, I, I cannot imagine a, a real estate developer taking down one of their buildings because it black and white. We double it. Yeah, right. Don't don't it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> oh man! So I think I think that that speaks. volumes for how uh, closely Fujisan is held in the in the minds of the Japanese people. So that was an origin uh, story, Mount Fuji. 
And a scribe story is Mount Hie. And Mount Hie is a historically significant mountain located northeast of Kyoto on the border of Kyoto and Shiga prefectures. And it's home to the important Enrakuji temple complex. For those who don't know, it's a sprawling complex of temples and buildings. And it's a key site in the development of Japanese Buddhism and culture. And Mount Hiei's history is closely tied with the development of Buddhism in Japan. In 788, the monk Saicho founded Enrakuji Temple on the mountain as a center for the study and practice of Tendai Buddhism, which he introduced after being in China. Over the centuries, Mount Hiei became a major center of Buddhist learning, and the Tendai sect grew in importance. Many influential monks studied throughout, studied and trained there before spreading Buddhism throughout Japan. So the founders of, of all the other schools of traditional Buddhism in Japan had been Tendai monks, with the exception of, of, of the Shingon sect. Due to its location northeast of Kyoto, Mount Tie was also seen as a protector of the capital based on geomantic principles. The mountain and Enrakuji temple wielded significant spiritual and political power. It should be noted that today, Mount Tie is a wilderness area. Beyond the mountain itself, its forests and the views that affords of Kyoto and Ohara, of Lake Biwa and Shiga. The main attraction is the temple complex of Enrakuji. The temple complex spreads out all over the mountain, but is concentrated on three areas located by foot trails. Uh, there are more, many more important minor temples and shrines. And here I should point out <clears throat> that before Saicho, the founder of Tendai, actually built his first temple on Mount Tien in 788, he went to the Shinto shrine at the base of the mountain to ask the kami of the mountain for permission to go up the mountain and build his temple. And so from that very early period, I mean, Shinto and, and Buddhism has, have always been um, intertwined uh, from the very beginning, or nearly the beginning, of Buddhism's introduction in Japan in the 6th century. Uh, but you can see that Mount Tie did have a spiritual significance before, but then became even more important became, as it was designated as a spiritual site. So it's in the case of Mount Fuji, it was designated, in, and obviously from the name of Fuji, Fuji itself means deity of, of fire. Uh, so that refers to the deity that resides within the mountain. In the case of Enra Fuji, the kami who reside there, um, reside there because kami exists within all the mountains. And Saicho, having gone to the shrine, gave it an uh, an additional importance when he put the Tendai temples on there that later became incredibly in, important. And, and I, I think that when I, Schumann could, could speak to this also, but when we did our training at Mount Tia, one of the interesting <clears throat> things is that it is still a wilderness area. And, and Koshin has also did his training there. And so it's still a wilderness area. You'll still have monkeys throwing things at you as you're on the trails doing your practices and or coming up and stealing things from inside the temples, the offerings inside the temples. And there are still boar and there are bears and there are poisonous snakes. Not unlike the Vatican, I might add. <laughs> <laughs> So let's go a bit closer to home. <clears throat> and there's the example of the Diné people, the Navajo or Native Americans. The Diné have four sacred mountains and the four sacred mountains surround Dinata, the Navajo, the Navajo homeland, providing deep connections between the land, spirituality and culture, which is the Diné world. Please excuse my pronunciation of Navajo words since I have absolutely no training in them. Atase Hatsling is the first man and Atase Adze the first woman. And placing these sacred mountains in each of the four directions, each is associated with a culture and a sacred stone linked to the direction. 
Sace Najimi, the white shell mountain, or Mount Blanca, is located in south central Colorado and represents the east. Tzotzil, the blue bead mountain, or Mount Taylor, northeast of Grants, New Mexico, represents the south. Duco Itzli, the yellow abalone shell mountain, or the San Francisco peaks near Flagstaff, Arizona, represents the west. And Nibe Nitsa, the obsidian mountain, or Mount Hesperus, located near Durango, Colorado, represents the north. And the four mountain locations are the locations of many important events in Diné sacred stories. They are also tied to the creation of the first Hogan, which can be viewed spiritually as forming a Hogan that contains the Diné universe. And a Hogan is a ritual building that is used for many of their, um, many of the, the Navajo ritual milestone events, like becoming a, a, a male, or be, becoming a man, or becoming a woman, um, having to do with, with funerary rites, etc. Um, we have a picture of those mountains here. The four sacred mountains represent the essence of life and cosmic harmony for the Navajo. They hold the sacred stories of their ancestors and all those who have inhabited the area throughout history. And these thoroughly stories are deeply intertwined with the Navajo culture and the way of life, serving as a source of guidance and wisdom for the present and future generations. The mountains are also viewed as living a living entity. And I think that this is important because from the perspective of sacred mountains, many of the mountains are viewed as as living entities in and of themselves. In other words, they're not merely uh, sacred with the belief that there are uh, spirits or deities or something within them. The mountain itself is viewed as an individual entity. And so, in fact, the Japanese people will often refer to Mount Fuji as Fujisan, as an example. Um, the mountains, <clears throat> excuse me, highlighting the importance of a place of shared history and culture. Despite the passage of time and the changes that have occurred, the Navajo people continue to hold these sacred places in high regard, recognizing their enduring spiritual and cultural significance. The necessities of the Navajo, such as food, water, timber, vegetation, flow through them. By cherishing the mountains and not wasting resources, the Navajo can earn a livelihood. And this is where we see a cautionary tale, one that instructs us as to the sacrality of mountains, of oceans, to all the environment that we're a part of. The mountains, and this is according to the Navajo, the mountains have been subjected to what is considered defilement and destruction at the hands of not only non-Indians, but also tribal authorities who have allowed the development and resource extraction to take place on the sacred sites. These activities has resulted in physical destruction of the mountains, as well as the disruption, disruption of the spiritual balance of the land. And so the Navajo attribute the social disintegration seen in today's society to the desecration of their sacred sites. They believe that the loss of respect for the land and its spiritual significance has contributed to a breakdown in the social fabric of their communities. This includes the erosion of traditional values, the rise of substance abuse and other social problems, and a general sense of alienation and disconnection from the land and its spiritual tradition. And I think that that's important, and it's something we should really contemplate. Overall, the treatment of sacred sites is a source of great concern for the Navajo people who view the preservation and protection of these places as essential to their cultural survival and their spiritual well-being. Something's in my throat, so we have to excuse me. And just to let you know, about, was it two weeks ago now or three weeks ago? Yeah. How long ago? Two. Two, two weeks ago. Schumann and I had COVID, and I still have respite. I'm, don't worry, I'm testing negative. I'm not contagious, but I still have respiratory issues. And my brain, I, well, 
<laughs> you want to move on? Yeah, yeah. It might it might not have been as bad if a worm had crawled inside. <laughs> just just saying. <laughs> so moving along. <laughs> so much closer to the home of Tendai Shun New York Betsuin, which is the Tendai Buddhist Institute in Jonsen Tendaiji. A comment people often make when they're visiting Tendai Buddhist Institute is how incredibly peaceful it is. Both the Hondo, which is the temple building itself, and the area surrounding provide a sense of peace and quiet. And this is in no small part due to its location in a notch to hills on the north and south of the property. In Feng Shui terms, this is referred to as the double dragon, which includes streams running down one of the hills, draining into the Kinderhook Creek, Creek, which runs east and west on the south side at the base of the of one of the hills. And this is an especially auspicious place for habitation, and especially so for Buddhist temples. That is to say, the double dragon is. As best I can have been able to discern from archaeological reports, the area had, was a hunting and fishing ground of the Stockbridge. Once a tribe of Lenape peoples from a group known as the Mohicans. It is unlikely that there were any permanent indigenous settlements here, though likely that there were seasonal encampments. And in archaeological surveys that I conducted over 30 years ago, did not find any evidence of encampments previous to the dairy farm that was once that once occupied the land just previous to becoming a site of the Karuna Tendai Dharma Center. We do know, we do not know if these hills that are part of the Taconic Range that blends into the Berkshire Mountains were considered exceptionally sacred by our Native, Native American progenitors of the land on which the Tendai Shunior Betsuin now sits, more so than any hills and mountains are considered sacred by the natives of North America. The location of the former farm is one of the main reasons that Schumann and I bought this site almost 30 years ago. Since then, we have May have been very careful to make changes in accord with the perceived sacred nature of the mountains and streams surrounding it, on which we renovated a Shaker-built former horse barn into our hondo. It was with this setting that Ichishima Sensei was inspired to brought, provide the name Junzan Tendaiji, or Mountain Cloud Tendai Temple, for our hondo when he visited us in 1998. In his explanation, it was because it seemed that the clouds were always touching the mountains, and the establishment name has Karuna, compassion in the title. For Schumann and I, Tendai Buddhist Institute seems to occupy a sacred space that has a sense of place similar to Mount Hiei, the foundational location of Tendai Buddhism in Japan. And this is very evident in the early morning and late afternoon when we can feel the harmony that surrounds us as we gaze into the mist that arise around us, much as it does on Mount Hie. In this context, we have not only venerated a sacred space, which we inherited from the Lenape people through the Shakers religious community with villages nearby, we have ascribed to it sacrality. We have returned much of the land around it back to nature from pasture land which we have then consecrated, and we consecrated the ground on which the temple now sits. So we're dedicated to honoring the land and its spirits into a far remote future. In the examination of safe, oh, this is the, excuse me, I'm giving you the, the resources. These are some of the resources that I used. I, I think I put this slide out of, out of uh, order, um, but these are the resources that I used. Is that an amazing picture? Yeah. In the examination of sacred mountains, it is my intention to point out that mountains have universally been considered sacred at several levels. We human beings have also treated these same sacred topographies as land from which we exact resources. When we lose sight of their sacredness and teeth treat them only as provisional forms, we begin to fracture our personal, individual, and our societal relationships 
with the natural world and the invisible spirits that reside therein. As the Navajo people now tell us, a disassociated the disassociation from the sacred has disastrous results. So when you drive into the parking lot at Tendai Buddhist Institute, join us online. I hope you can sense the sacredness that surrounds us. Know that this sacredness has been here for longer than history records. And it's up to each one of us to venerate the spirit and breath and breathe in the gift of this life and feel a sense of gratitude for our co-inhabitants. The presentation was more than an intellectual curiosity. This could easily have been given, uh, excuse me, it's more than a spiritual uh, curiosity. It was a plea to take our interaction with the natural world in which we live as more than a platform for our behavior or resources to be extracted. It is a sacred act. And I'd like to conclude with a Native American prayer that could easily have been given by a Buddhist bodhisattva, a Taoist sage, or a Shinto worshiper. This came from the book uh, Dharma Gaya, I believe. The whole thing is right there in your hands. Your intimate, knowing, empty handed, capable hands. The hands you look into to see your fate, and that fate which we, all of us together, bring about on this planet. Every cell of each one of us, children and mothers, fathers, brother cedar, uncle mountain stream, sister Aurora, aunt snowfield, cousin grizzly, grandmother night sky, grandfather do, one inside the other, inside the other, which is no other than ourselves.